Uh, my name's Dave Hone, and I'm a lecturer in zoology at Queen Mary University of London. I want to know what's happening. Tell me a little bit about this paper that you have coming out in Pier J. Well, for the last few years, I've been working quite heavily on dinosaur behavior and ecology and trying to piece together interactions in ancient environments, and in particular doing this through bite marks, so trace fossils of basically direct biting on bones by generally carnivorous dinosaurs. Um, and in this case, we've got the skull of an animal called Despletosaurus, Despletosaurus is a large tyrannosaur, so a very close relative of T-Rex, lived a few million years before it, but looked pretty similar in overall size and shape and appearance. And this animal has numerous different um, marks across the skull, which include both those that are pre-mortem, so injuries during life that later healed, and also a pretty major post-mortem injury, uh, which, based on the context of the fossil, myself and my co-author Darren Tankey are interpreting as... Uh, basically scavenging, so feeding on this animal by another tyrannosaur. And just for the the layperson in the audience, um, how do you differentiate between the different types of bites, those that are maybe incurred during a fight or something that is the result of scavenging? Right. Well, fortunately, um, you know, certain things in biology are, are really pretty common and, and, and cover huge numbers and very diverse groups of animals. And one of those is the way that bone changes when it's been damaged. I'm sure many people are aware of the kind of story that, you know, if you break a bone and it heals, that's the one place that that bone will never break again because it's actually stronger than the surrounding bone. You can even see this on x-rays. There's usually a little kind of little slightly thicker ridge or ring of bone at that point. And this is true for all kinds of animals. Um, when the bone is damaged, it will change and modify itself as it repairs. And you can actually see this because the texture and structure of the bone, you can literally see how it has altered on the surface. And actually, in a couple of cases on this one, uh, we actually see a color change to the bone as well. I suspect that wouldn't have been there in life. And actually, this is a very subtly different chemical signature in the repaired bone. That means that when it's fossilized, there's a subtly different set of arrangements. And that means it's actually a color change as well. But there's really quite a neat effect that certainly I hadn't seen before. That's really interesting. So you're getting uh, you know, different different chemical interactions going that, on. That's what yeah. I guess. I, I, I don't know if anyone's looked at it before. It's the only thing I can realistically think of because it was only these damaged areas that showed it, which was quite nice. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, on the flip side, looking at the post-mortem injuries, of course, those don't show any healing. Um, so there's no trace of repair. Now, of course, at one level, this could be that they were injured, you know, immediately before death or, or a few days beforehand, and obviously no healing had kind of kicked in. But in the context of this fossil, uh, we've actually got some evidence that the bones had been moved around at the point at which that bite took place. Uh, and by, given basically how the specimen had rotted and, and kind of fallen away in the ground prior to its burial, this suggests that actually it had been dead days, possibly even weeks before this happened, and therefore obviously was scavenging rather than a, immediately some kind of kill or be any kind of injury to the bone that was immediately pre-mortem or, you know, day or so before it died. Right. And then how do you match up tooth types? So you say, okay, this is a tyrannosaur tooth and this matches this bite perfectly versus, you know, some other raptor type species. Right. Or... Quite. Um, Sometimes that's really quite hard or even impossible. We're lucky with the tyrannosaurs that at the time that they were around, or at least the, certainly the later larger tyrannosaurs, like Tyrannosaurus and a bunch of others, actually Tyrannosaurus or Tyrannosaurs were the only big carnivores in that environment at that time. So, for example, when Despletosaurus was around, there was another large Tyrannosaur that lived alongside it, and there were a bunch of big predators, things like... Um, uh, large pterosaurs, but they don't have teeth. They only have beaks. There were crocodiles, but they were mostly small. There were things like dromaeosaurs, animals close to Velociraptor, but they were small, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's hard to say, for example, which tyrannosaur was doing the biting. It's very hard to tell them apart off a couple of marks on the bone. But when you've got what are very large teeth that are well spaced apart, then they're big teeth coming from a big animal, and there's only one credible candidate for that, or one 
collective set of candidates, and that's right. the big tyrannosaurs. In some other environments, it's very hard. If it's a small carnivore has left those marks, it could be any one of a number of small predators. It could be small members of or juveniles of large predators, mm -hmm. and the whole thing gets a lot more confusing very rapidly. So, but actually, from that perspective, these tyrannos tyrannosaurs generally, and actually Tyrannosaurus, which is unique in being the only big carnivore, are actually really useful for that kind of stuff. Whenever you find a bone. Um, from the time and place that T-Rex lived with bite marks on it from a big carnivore, you know exactly what species it was because it's the only one there. Right. Uh, so that, that helps really quite a lot. And it does make them not unique, but certainly very useful kind of tool that you can immediately filter the results down quite heavily with, with a fair degree of confidence without having to do anything complicated at all. Which makes it really nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, it saves a lot of time. <laughs> And so these uh, different tyrannosaurus species, um, do they have, uh, did they have much range overlap or were they pretty much there's one species in the area that you were looking or, or how were they, how were they kind of spread yeah, out? It, it, very, it certainly varies in, in time and place. Uh, Tyrannosaurus does appear to be unique in being basically the only big carnivore in its environment when it was around. For the others, there's generally two or three. Um, so we have, for example, Despletosaurus lives alongside a thing called Gorgosaurus. Gorgosaurus at one time or another certainly lived alongside another animal called Albertosaurus. In Asia, there's this big T-Rex type thing called Tarbosaurus, but that lived alongside at least a couple of other Tyrannosaurs. Mm -hmm. So you regularly had two, three, four in the same time in the same place. And actually that's really pretty normal. You know, you look to big environments these days and okay, yes, we've lost lots of species, in mm -hmm. recent centuries and millennia, but, you know, Africa, lion, leopard, hunting dog, cheetah, lion, wow. hyena, all overlap. Um, in Europe until recently, you know, we had wolves and bears and a few other things. In North America, you've got wolves, bears, puma, um, and right. indeed several species of bear. So it's really quite common to have multiple different large carnivores in single environments. It's just unusual in this case that actually they're all from the same relatively narrow um, kind of family equivalent set of species rather than much more disparate things. You know, we're used to thinking, you know, there's a cat and a dog and a bear. Right. Um, and actually in this case, it's it's a Tyrannosaur and a Tyrannosaur and a Tyrannosaur <laughs> when it comes to the big ones. And so um, when you're looking at um, Despletus and what it was doing ecologically in its habitat. I mean, the big tyrannosaur that people are familiar with is T-Rex. And mm -hmm. there have been many stories over the years from its, it was um, a carnivorous predator that could run really fast. And then people said, oh, maybe it doesn't run very fast. And <laughs> maybe it's just a scavenger. Um, you know, so, so how does the evidence that you have found tie in with the story of what the tyrannosaurs did while they were alive. Yeah, well, I think the first thing to say is that that's that kind of long-standing um, antagonistic idea of the predators or scavengers really needs to die a, a hideous death. Okay. I think virtually all paleontologists are quite happy with the idea that they did both. And again, that's exactly what we see amongst almost all modern large carnivores. Some hunt more than they scavenge, some scavenge more than they hunt, but none of them are a hundred percent one or a hundred or even kind of like 90 percent one and 90 percent the other and indeed for, for at least some of the tyrannosaurs including t-rex and tarbosaurus we have direct evidence of both hunting and of scavenging so it's pretty reasonable to assume that basically all of the tyrannosaurs and indeed most of the big carnivorous dinosaurs were doing both at one time or another um in this case it just kind of adds a little more to the Kind of scavenging aspect because as i say we're quite happy this animal had been long dead when it was fed upon um yes some animals kill things and then could spend days or even weeks feeding on them yeah. but generally then you see bite marks all over the skeleton we don't we only see them on this jaw and in the head not on the other parts so this does look like something that had rotted fallen apart and it just kind of grabbed or bit at the last little bit that it could access so this mm -hmm. does show you know more supporting evidence of scavenging in tyrannosaurs but also that fits into that just kind of general pattern of you know that's a really quite common thing you know most um carnivores don't tend to feed that much on other big carnivores 
Um, partly because they're just rare. You know, mm-hmm. you will see a hundred zebra for every lion that you see if you right. go out to Africa. Um, you know, so lions aren't going to be encountering other lions and hyena that often. And now we're talking about animals, you know, multiple tons in mass. There's not going to be one every half mile. Um, no. But it, again, it shows part of that pattern. If they came across something that they could eat, they were going to eat it. And it looks like they did just that. And they're not um, and they're not going to care whether or not it's another tyrannosaur and feel bad about it. <laughs> no, no, probably not. I mean, I mean, they're at like least yum. in some cases, yeah, but <laughs> and at least in some cases, these animals quite probably avoided each other or avoided feeding on each other to a certain degree, because obviously carnivores actually tend to focus parasites because they're always feeding on other animals. They actually tend to carry a pretty heavy parasite load. Um, it's been suggested that's part of the reason for some of the human cultural taboos in feeding on carnivores. You know, not many cultures do really eat things like dogs and cats. And she there's a good reason for that. They're often loaded with diseases uh, that often some of the herbivores aren't. Um, so that may be a reason that maybe some of them tended to avoid that. I mean, there's no real way of knowing that for the dinosaurs. But certainly it's plausible. Um that they did. I think just on average, this would almost certainly be a rare event, as I say, simply because there is not one of these guys every half mile, even every five or even every 10 miles. It's probably quite rare for them actually to have come across another dead individual. Um, and then, of course, may or may not be hungry at that time. So that would further reduce the odds of them ever actually doing this. But but clearly it's happened. And it has happened more than once. There's actually a T-Rex toe bone with tooth marks on it, which can, again, can only have come from a T-Rex. So it does look like there's at least one other tyrannosaur directly cannibalizing its same species. Your research was, uh, was crowdfunded. Yeah, that's, that's right. At the time that I basically got invited to do this project, my co-author kind of had it set up. He'd done a lot of work. He was actually the preparator on this specimen. So that stuff you always see Um, in documentaries of some guy sitting in a lab painstakingly picking away at all the little bits of rock to get the the bones out. That's what he does for the vast majority of his time. Um, And so he'd spotted most of these things and wanted me to help him out researching it. And at the time, I was actually unemployed. I was between jobs, so I didn't have any salary and I didn't have any support funding for my research, but I do a huge amount of outreach. I write for lots of websites. I do lots of public speaking events and stuff like this. And people were starting to look at crowdfunding as a general thing, but also including for science. And I thought it's worth a shot. It's, it's a relatively cheap project. It's a flight to Canada from the UK and a week's accommodation. I'm not asking for huge amounts of money. You know, you never know quite what's going to happen. There's no guarantee, but it, it looks like a fairly basic story for us to write up so I can at least propose what we're likely to find. And yeah, a lot of friends and colleagues and well wishes and people who are obviously fans of my stuff very generously contributed and we made the total and I got to go and do it. That's wonderful. Is this the first time that you've used crowdfunding to fund your research? Yeah, so so far the first and only, though though a second project came out of it because while I was out there, I saw another specimen and realized there was a paper available in that as well. And that's already actually been, that's just been submitted for for review as well. So hopefully there's at least a kind of two for one going on of the first. Yeah, that's, I mean, that that's value for all the people who helped you out. (laughs) You didn't just fund one experiment. (laughs) (laughs) Two for the price of one. There we go. Yeah. So do you think that this is something um, that you might use again if it's, if it seems like it's the right kind of project to use crowdfunding? Yeah, I'd I'd certainly consider it. Um, I think now that I've done it once, I have a much better idea of how it works, how you should run it as the researcher. Um, And I guess the, I mean, it's probably true of all crowdfunding projects, regardless of context and not just within science, Mm -hmm. but you do kind of have that um, frisson almost of, you you never know quite what's going to happen. You know, it's like, I can say this looks like a really cool project and I'm going to go and do this. But there's always the chance you get there and go, ah, it's, it's not what I thought, or ah, the paper's been rejected, or something's come up, and you know, I'd, I'd feel terrible if something went horribly wrong when I spent people's money, um, yeah. and that, that had never occurred to me when I when I took this on. Um, and hindsight is twenty twenty, or maybe I was just <laughs> lucky or brave or naive. 
Um, but it's certainly an area I'd have to think about a lot more next time. And I do think, yeah, you have to pick the right project, A, in terms of getting the funders excited. Yeah. You know, obviously the prospect of cannibalistic tyrannosaurs was never going to be unpopular. Right. Uh, so that helped, <laughs> that helped enormously. How many um, of your funders were eight-year-old boys? No. <laughs> um, as far as I can tell, none of them actually. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that, that that's an aspect which is really going to help push it and you know i'm well aware that i'm extremely lucky that i get to work on dinosaurs and that they are very popular and i genuinely feel bad for colleagues of mine who do incredible and exciting and important research and no one cares because it's not a dinosaur or it's right. not a bird or it's not some giant carnivore um right. and they find it way way harder to push those things and that that's a real shame um so yeah. I, I hope if nothing else people you know think more about what the project means rather than just oh it's got tyrannosaurs in it yeah. at the same time however <laughs> please keep funding my research because it does <laughs> um and yeah. then but and, yeah it's, it's it's definitely one for the future and then on top of it you didn't just it seems like you're in in this entire project you have chosen like all of the I don't know kind of the edge pushing um abilities that the web are allow is allowing now. So you're publishing in an in an open science journal, Pierre J, yep. and you're using crowdfund you use crowdfunding for it. So there's these two decisions that you made together. Just this is not what an average scientist does. No, no, I guess not. I mean, I, I'm I'm a I'm a pretty big proponent of open access. I I really like it as a concept. Again, my unemployed days and between job days, it could be really hard to keep your research going when you couldn't always access the papers. You're forever scrounging mm -hmm. stuff. I do lots of outreach, and I know lots of people who are not in research institutes, but really do go and read scientific papers and understand them, and are getting something from that and contributing to that helps enormously. There is the kind of flip side, which is whether we like it or not, there is a certain degree of political game playing when it comes to where you publish your papers. And, you know, I don't think anyone is really immune from that in their careers. But in this case, it's like, you know, I, I couldn't see any reason not to put this straight into an OA journal. It was something that I kind of said as part of the pitch, you know, as I get published, it's going in one form or another into an OA journal. Um, because again, you know, I can always, I could have easily handed out PDFs or sent print copies to, to whoever supported me, but it's like, yes, you deserve to get something back special for contributing to this, but if this is effectively, to a degree, a citizen science project by you contributing to allowing me to do that, well, then we should put it back out to everyone as far as possible. And, and again, something I hadn't considered the first time around, the, the obvious flip side or problem to that is, well, if they reject the paper, there's only so many OA journals you can go to. <laughs> <laughs> you can easily say, find yourself, well, I'm either going to have to break a promise or not publish it. And exactly. Is a, is, a, is, a, is a great uh, solution. So uh, again, again, perhaps naivety on my part, but um, or, or maybe it's just a good paper. But you know, it's there are further things to think about, which I certainly hadn't considered. But I think that kind of happens when it's kind of new. You yeah. know, there's only been, um, you know, I can think of only a couple of other dinosaur projects which have been done like this, so crowdfunded. Um, there are some websites springing up. It was a place called experiment.com mm -hmm. who kind of acted as the host for me and were extremely supportive, and I'm very grateful to them. And they're starting to spring up and starting to spread and, and, and really doing a good job. But it's still kind of new to everyone really. Yeah. And when I first kind of put the pitch online, which would have been about two and a half years ago, I think it was very new indeed. I mean, there was very little like it indeed. Websites are springing up all over the place and closing again rapidly when they found they couldn't do it. And uh, yeah, it, it was, it was early days. Yeah. And it still is. I mean, there are plenty of, you know, even with uh, products that people are trying to get crowdfunded on Kickstarter, some, there mm -hmm. are lots of products that have just never materialized and other things. So it is kind of from the perspective of the person doing the funding for a science project, you have to yeah. take in all these, like you're taking them into account now. The, the people who want to fund science have to take all these potential risks into account as well. Yeah, the definitely. money that you're funding, it's going toward trying to get a result, but you don't know what the result's going to actually be and you don't know if you're going to be able to get it published. So No, no, you know, yeah. it's 
you know, that kind of famous cliche, you know, if we knew the response, if you knew the answer, we wouldn't be doing it in the first place. It's, right. it's, it's science because we don't know yet. Exactly. Um, so there's, there's that kind of <laughs> built in. And, and, and also, you know, the kind of other, you know, unforeseen problems, I mean, particularly to a degree with paleontology. I mean, you know, the whole project was basically centered around this one specimen. Um, and obviously the Royal Terrell Museum where I was working it, but you know, you never know what happened. I, I worked on a Tyrannosaur skull in China a number of years ago and the, the paper was largely done and we went back to the museum to see the specimen again, just to check all of our observations and they dropped it <gasps> and it had basically shattered. Oh. And <laughs> you, know, you can't, <laughs> you, uh-uh. you simply can't account for that or, or plan for it. And, no. <laughs> You know, we planned the trip and booked the flights and the hotels and everything, and there's just a box of pieces. I mean, we helped them put it back together, but obviously some of the stuff we wanted to do kind of became impossible at that point. Yeah. And, you know, you just can't legislate for those kinds of issues, and those things do happen in – you know, I mean, similar things I'm sure in other fields. You know, you can can go to the Large Hadron Collider and that's the day it shuts down or – you know, has a power cut or something, but but that's that's really true. You know, and on big grants that are multiply funded, you can usually write off one trip like that and go, well, okay, we've lost some of our money, but we'll go back next year. We'll go back in three months. If that's the entire total of your project, and you've burned all the money to go and do it, um, then you've <laughs> well, it's not necessarily your fault, but you've still got a lot of explaining to do. Um, so much, and explaining. yeah, that, that's a it's a, it's a certainly a as I say, all these kinds of things, it's a, it's a very different take on how you proceed with research. And that's, yeah, something that I think, I don't think people haven't been thinking about it, but I suspect neither people putting out the pitches nor some of the people funding these things have really put all of that thought into. And to a degree, I'm not sure quite what you can do with it, but yeah. I think maybe, for example, a future kind of emergency reserve plan or backup plan or, or, or alternate. In my case, yeah. I've actually got the, the opposite problem, which is a friend of mine put me up while I was in the, at the museum. So the money I'd budgeted for a hotel, I didn't actually spend. So I've actually got a small surplus. Awesome. And how, how do you pay that back? Or who do you right. pay it back to from dozens of often anonymous donors? Right. Um, uh, I, what I'd suggested, because I, I obviously I run a little kind of hidden blog that's just for these people that's part of their kind of feedback and response and what mm-hmm. i've said is well i'll donate it to one of the oa journals to try and help other people sponsor their research and it just puts yeah. some more stuff in the public domain and i think everyone's been quite happy with that idea but yeah when it first happened i did all the budgeting and went oh i've got a couple of hundred bucks left i didn't expect what do i well, do now, now what? <laughs> and you know it just never occurred to me i i come back with more you know more rather than less and less yeah that is the rarity, probably. But <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for your time. This has been really well, interesting. Thank you very much. I know you're quite busy this week, so I won't keep you any longer. <laughs> Good no luck with all that. your research, and I look forward to seeing the conversation that arises online in the journal as thank a result you very much of your indeed. paper. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.